I'll be discussing uh, a novel therapeutic approach to solid tumor treatment uh, using oncolytic viruses that are uh, engineered from Dicinia virus that can specifically target uh, cancer cells and eradicate them by multiple mechanisms of action. So I'll start by giving an overview of the field and then describe the uh, so-called solve product class that we've uh, developed at Generex. And then, uh, importantly, spend some time on JX594 uh, lead product clinical data, and then uh, discuss phase 2B and 3 uh, development plans. So when it comes to uh, targeting cancer, as we all know, it's a very uh, complex disease with multiple hallmarks of cancer as described by Hanahan and Weinberg. And because it's such a complex disease, it's very difficult to target with therapies that hit one specific binding site on one molecule. And I think. Uh, what we see generally with improved target therapies is, is several months uh, improvement in overall survival, but frequent relapse. Uh, nevertheless, most of uh, large pharmaceuticals uh, are uh, sort of in a B2 mode where they're really uh, focusing on B2 approaches. Just for example, there are 44 small molecule VEGF receptor inhibitors in development. So we really need novel therapeutic approaches to cancer to get around this problem. Now, what I'll be discussing today is the use of viruses to attack cancers. Now, that's the targeting. What about the actual mechanisms of tumor destruction? And number one, obviously, is cancer cell oncolysis, as we just described. But importantly, this is also an active immunotherapy, acting as a cancer vaccine, which is personalized to the you know, patient's own tumor. As the virus replicates, it releases tumor antigens to infiltrate uh, immune cells. And the GMCSF is, a, is an activator and recruiter of uh, antigen-presenting cells. And then finally, we've discovered this virus also leads to tumor vascular ablation. Again, that's not something we engineered into the virus, but it's something that uh, we're just starting to understand uh, how that occurs. So we hope now that we have something that has solved, uh, retained the safety and selectivity of those first generation products, but, oops, this is sensitive, um, but also has a transgene arming capacity similar to the Herpes virus from, from Biovex, which was recently purchased by Amgen, but now gives us finally the, the IV stability and IV delivery that we wanted. So this is just an example of preclinical data with luciferase labeled uh, JX594 in a variety of different murine tumor models, um, both uh, uh, xenografts as well as a transgenic here. And you can see, see that these viruses very specifically target tumors in the body after IV administration. And again, we've seen this in immunocompetent as well as immunodeficient uh, mice. It's highly selective uh, targeting of tumors uh, after IV administration. So I'll now get into the clinical development. GX594 has been used in over 130 patients uh, to date with a variety of common solid tumors by intratumoral injection, intravenous administration, or a combination of both. We have an active program in lattice carcinoma and HCC. Uh, and in, in CRC, I'll focus most of my time here today on these proof of concept phase one, two studies, and then on this randomized phase two uh, dose ranging study in HCC. So we thought it was very important in the development of this agent to define these mechanisms of action that we predicted and show that they were happening in humans. So the first order of business was to say, is the virus replicating in humans? So on the left, you see a panel from a uh, publication late last year in Nature where we showed after an IV administration we could in infect uh, tumor nodules in patients. In this case, we see immunohistochemical chemical staining in brown for replicating JX594 in this colorectal metastasis um, and uh, spreading waves of central necrosis. And importantly, the adjacent normal tissue is negative. So again, as is seen commonly with these oncolytic viruses, highly selective target of tumor cells in the body on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. On the right-hand side is another mechanism we use to look at viral replication. This is the concentration of JX594 in the blood over time, showing initial clearance, followed by these replication waves at two different dose levels between day three and day 22, confirming that this is products actually replicating in the body and being shed back into the bloodstream over time. We also started to study the induction of anti-tumoral immunity in these patients. We've shown induction of uh, tumor-specific antibodies that can lyse tumor cells. And in this case, we're starting to explore cell mediated immunity. So um, in this particular patient, uh, the radiologists um, who were doing these reads discovered that uh, these 
hypervascular typical HCC tumors uh, in the liver here on the left, over time they became progressively necrotic and inflamed with peritumal inflammation. And uh, again, these two nozzles were not directly injected with JX594, they just saw the, the virus and the immune cells uh, uh, coming in through the bloodstream. And on biopsy, we saw dense T cell infiltration within these tumors with scattered residual tumor cells and severe necrosis. So um, we're just starting now uh, together with uh, Malcolm Brenner's group at Baylor to, to study the induction of tumor specific uh, T cell immunity in these patients. Now, as I mentioned, we, we did get IV delivery as we, as we recently published. This is just data showing the dose response, so at low doses after single IV infusion in patients, there's no evidence of delivery of the tumors, but at high doses, we see reproducible uh, dose-dependent delivery. In this case, this is looking at induction of, that, of antibodies to that uh, beta-galactosidase transgene, but we also showed this by IHC and qPCR and tumor biopsies uh, as well. Um, there was anti-tumoral activity at these high doses, despite this being just a single administration. This is a modified resist response in a mesothelioma patient. Um, importantly, the safety here was uh, uh, very uh, favorable. Patients get a, a significant flu-like symptom for the first uh, 24 hours or so with fevers, chills, myalgias, but then uh, feel well despite ongoing viral replication in between uh, treatments. We did see antitumoral activity in these various phase one studies. This is a uh, poor prognosis renal cell carcinoma with this extremely large mass in the abdomen, 15 centimeters, plus miliary disease in the lungs and the liver. Um, this patient is now alive and disease free for more than five years after treatment of JX594 and then uh, transient exposure to submitted. Um, so suggestive that we can induce long term uh, immune. Uh, clearance of a tumor. This again was not a directly injected tumor, but only saw JX594 through the bloodstream. This is an example of another bulky tumor undergoing a significant response. This is an HCC metastasis that underwent a complete response after direct injection. So on the basis of that phase one data, we moved into a randomized phase two clinical trial in advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. We knew that both dose levels, low dose and high dose, were uh, effective locally, but we also knew the high dose would be more systemically active, so we elected to randomize to two different dose levels, a high dose of 10 to the 9th PFU versus 10 to the 8th PFU uh, in 30 patients who were heavily pretreated with local regional and in some cases systemic therapies. Patients received just three intratumoral doses on day 1, 15, and 29 and the endpoints for overall survival, tumor response, and safety. And this was a multinational trial uh, carried out at eight different sites in the US, Canada, and South Korea. So tumor responses were seen on this study. I'll just show you a couple of examples. This is a complete response on the upper, in the upper panels, which was quite unusual in this study um, to see a complete response in these patients with cirrhotic livers. What we more commonly saw was a so-called resist response or modified resist response where you see progressive uh, necrosis over time in these tumors. You see that vasculature uh, being knocked out progressively over time. And this is more common in, in cirrhotic livers which, uh, in which it's difficult to see a complete response. So uh, disease control rate by M resist was about 50% and we had a, a approximately 60% CHOI response rate on the study. This is the overall survival by dose. You can see the high dose patients had a survival advantage compared to the low dose active control patients. Uh, the overall median survival of the high dose group was 14.1 months versus 6.7 months for low dose, with a hazard ratio of 0.39 and a P of 0.02. What's important to remember in this study is actually all three doses are right here in the first month. So we really believe we have an opportunity now to do more chronic dosing to try to maintain and, and enlarge the survival benefit. But there certainly does appear to be a tail of the curve which suggests there's an ongoing viral and or immune response uh, against the cancer. Again, it's important to be very, very careful when one compares to historical controls. But I think this is an important graph just showing historical data with seraphic versus placebo in advanced HCC, as you know, SRAF is the only approved therapy for HCC. You can see the average from prior studies of survival with placebo 
uh, or with serafinib. And again, our low dose active control is, is, is behaving as you predict. Uh, so it does appear that we have a, a, a very typical population of advanced, of advanced HCC patients on this trial. The 14 month survival is obviously promising and needs to be uh, confirmed in a subsequent study. So based on this data, we've, we've got a, a two-tiered approach. One is to target serafinib failure patients uh, in the so-called second-line HCC patients, and the other is a front-line strategy to compare head-to-head -head with serafinib. In the serafinib refractory population, we've got a, an open study we refer to as Traverse. This is a phase 2B randomized, randomizing patients 2-1 to JX594 versus best supportive care and looking at primary, uh, the, the overall survival is the primary endpoint. And then uh, early next year, we'll initiate a phase three study comparing JX594, followed by serafinib to serafinib alone. Uh, again, in frontline patients, randomizing one to one uh, with a primary endpoint of overall survival. So I hope I've been able to show you that, that with this platform, we really have the ability to target cancers by, with multiple mechanisms of action simultaneously. The analogy I like to make is uh, to a smartphone. You, you, instead of doing one thing, you've got the ability to engineer in multiple mechanisms of action into the virus to attack the cancer by multiple mechanisms. So we've used GMCSF in the case of JX594, but you might imagine you could have other immune stimulators, protein activating enzymes, uh, any uh, vascular targeting peptides, any number of things you can engineer into these viruses to get highly selective uh, expression of those, of those uh, of proteins in cancers uh, to target them by multiple mechanisms. So as mentioned earlier, it really does take a village to run these studies and the results I've shown you today are the uh, results of a huge number of uh, uh, people chipping in in, in various companies and academic sites and, and of course the patients and their families are instrumental in these studies. So with that, I'll stop and, and take some questions. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a great question. So, so the vast majority of our patients going into these studies have a history of vaccination with vaccinia. So anybody over the age of 40 generally has been vaccinated. Um, and about 50% of our patients will have baseline neutralizing antibodies being detected by vaccinia. To date, we've seen no correlation between baseline antibody levels or induced antibody levels in efficacy. So I think, again, the way this therapy is working is part of it is the, the viral effect, but then part of it is this immune effect. And I think, you know, based on the immunization history, it may be, you may get more or less of, of one mechanism versus another. But to date, the response rates, safety, and, and overall survival are equivalent. Yeah, I think that probably accounts for some success with the virus. Yeah, so, so Joe's referring to another virus in this field that, um, from a company, Biovax, which was recently acquired by Amgen. Um, and this is a herpes virus that's cancer selected that also ex uh, expresses GMCSF. And so this is, again, a, a potent local oncolytic plus an immune activator. And they've seen some very promising data in melanoma showing durable, complete responses systemically. They published that in uh, JCO uh, a couple of years back, and now they're uh, nearing completion of a phase three study, which could be an approval study in the first of its kind for this field in melanoma, and again, we expect data from that study uh, somewhere around the end of this year or early next year, and that would be a huge advance for this field. Again, the big differentiator for vaccine versus herpes is, again, herpes is great local, regional, and an immune, systemic immune inducer, um, but at least to date has not been used IV because of that, the, the clearance issues from the blood. Question? Yeah, so in the uh, cancer vaccine world, you're probably familiar with Provenge, for example. So that's patient-specific, right, in terms of their own cells. They have to make a new batch each time. In contrast, we call this off-the-shelf, just meaning every patient gets the same exact product. It's just a lot easier to manufacture, characterize, release it to patients. But the reason we say it's patient-specific is because what, what the virus is doing is simply licensing the cells releasing tumor antigens, recruiting inflammatory cells, and the GMCSF is activating the, the antigen-presenting cells. But then we let the body decide what antigens to target. 
So we're not trying to be smart and saying, oh, this is the key to or whatever that is. We let the body's own immune system decide. And what we find is we're getting polyclonal immune responses coming up to the cancer cells. Um, we're just starting to study the uh, CTL response. So what I think you're going to get is more of a polyclonal immune response to the tumor, which should then make it less likely that the tumor can avoid uh, the immune response and, and evade it, because you're getting it by, by multiple mechanisms. Okay. Do you know how large your phase three trial will need to be? Yes, I do. <laughs> and are you going to tell us? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I misunderstood your point. Um, yeah, the, the, it's, it's 450 patients. 450 yeah. patients, randomized one to one. Exactly, exactly. And that gives us about a 90% power to detect a hazard ratio of 0.7 with a P of 0.05. So um, the, the phase 2B is only 120 patients, so again, our power there is about 80% to hit a hazard ratio of about 0.53. So again, uh, under power compared to phase 3. Yeah, it's an important point. So it turns out that the way that vaccine is working, and many of these oncolytic viruses are working, is they rely on activation of these pathways in the tumor. So if you hit with the TKI like serafin, and you shut off those pathways, you actually shut off viral replication. So you've got three hundred layers of so yeah, we yeah. So serafin, for example, hits RAF kinase, which is right in the middle of that EGFR RAS pathway. If we hit with serafin, we stop viral replication very effectively. <laughs> You can actually do it with Gleevec and some other small molecule inhibitors. So I think with these oncolytic viruses, you want those pathways activated, let the virus do its thing, and then once you debulk the tumor, uh, or potentially at the time of relapse, then you can hit with the TKI, but, but not simultaneous. Okay. How is your therapy essentially protected from the kind of tumor lysis syndrome that Carl has encountered in CLL. Do you just have a lower total tumor burden with HCC or? Yeah, it's, it's you know, we, we had some patients on phase one, a couple of patients who had very uh, rapidly progressive tumors like melanoma that was a high tumor burden where we did see evidence of tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, I think these patients, again, um, you know, it's probably more gradual tumor destruction. You know, the virus has to spread cell to, you know, cell to cell in a solid tumor. There's barriers to spread. So I think the killing is just probably more gradual. So we see LDH come up and, and we see some evidence of low grade tumor lysis, but we don't see the actual overt tumor lysis. Did you see, you know, leukemia? Yeah. 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 Yeah.